Hello, my name is Tim Davies and welcome to our FTS online class. We're now on to the organizing, visualizing and describing data reading. So as we know, data is a key input in the investment management process. And we also know that there is so much data out there. So for example, in the last few years, we, we've seen the rise of big data and machine learning. And we're gonna be looking at those in more detail in the fintech reading but what what we're going to be looking at now is how can we turn data into useful information because we need to be able to use the data now this reading uh, it, it is a long reading so it's going to take us quite a few classes to get through it but it doesn't really matter because it's not it's not, it's not a difficult reading so i think we're going to be just fine over here so let's then get started Right, so the first LOS asks us to look at data types and it says, identify and compare data types. So just before we compare data types, let's have a look at a basic definition of data. So it's a collection of numbers, characters, words, and text, but not only these, data also includes images, audio, and video. So these can be in raw or organized format to represent facts or info. So as we were just saying, what, what do we want? We want the data to be in organized format so that we can use it. So uh, the first comparison we're going to do is compare numerical to categorical data. So with numerical, it's also called quantitative data. These are values that represent measured or counted quantities as a number. So we're looking here at, at numbers. So we under the numerical data, we get continuous or we get discrete data. So with continuous data, these can be measured and they can take on any numerical value in a certain range. So for example, if we buy a share, you know, we're not sure what the rate of return is going to be down the line. Or if we make an investment, you know, we don't know what that future value is going to be. It, it can take on any number. Or if we buy a share, you know, we don't know what the dividend is that we're going to be receiving. It can take on any numbers. So these are continuous data. Now, if we compare this to discrete data, these are numerical values that result from a counting process. So they are limited now to a finite number of values. So for example, the number of coupon payments for a bond. So we're going to be covering bonds in a lot of detail when we get to the fixed income section. But just for now, if a company wants to borrow money, one, one thing they can do is issue a bond, which means that they borrow money from investors, but of course, they got to pay the money back. Not, not only do they need to pay the money back, they also need to pay interest on what they borrow. So this interest we call coupons. Now, bonds, they can pay coupons uh, annually or semi-annually or even quarterly. And most of the time they pay two coupons a year. So it's a semi or what we call a semi-annual pay bond. So let's say, for example, we've got a company, they've issued a bond for 10 years. In other words, they're going to be borrowing money for a 10-year period and they are paying two coupons per year. That means they're going to be making a total of 20 coupon payments over the life of the bond. So there we've got, we limited now to a finite number of payments. And then another example here is the frequency of discrete compounding. So remember with discrete compounding, we have got a certain number of compounding periods per year. So like we did in the time value of money. So we could do monthly compounding. So there would be 12 compounding periods per year, or we could do semi-annual compounding, which would be two a compound, two compounding periods per year, or we could do quarterly compounding, which would be four compounding periods per year. Right now, we need to compare numerical data to categorical data. So categorical data, we also call qualitative data. So these are values that describe a quality or characteristic of a group of observations. So they're used as labels to divide a data set into groups to summarize and to visualize the data. So they usually take, uh, they usually take only a limited number of values that are mutually exclusive. So mutually exclusive, this means that it is one 
or the other. So let's try these examples. We can look at companies that are either going to default or they're not going to default on their debt. Or a company could be an acquisition target or it is not an acquisition target. Or <clears throat> a company can make a dividend payment or it, it may or, or does not make a dividend payment. So those are some examples there for us. Right, now let's just continue now with our categorical or our qualitative data. So the categorical data, it, it can be classified into nominal data or ordinal data. So first of all, with nominal data, here are the values, they can't, they can't be organized in a logical order. So for example, in the mutual fund space, or some people, we also call it, you know, unit trust, this is where many investors pull money together, and now the funds are managed by a professional investment manager. So we get different types of classifications for these, like, for example, we can get equity growth, or we can then also get equity value. So what we can do is we can call equity growth funds, say category one, so let's call it C1. We, and then we can call equity value category two, so let's call it C2. So we'll be talking a lot more about this when, when we get to the equity section, you know, what is, a, what is a growth company, what is a value company. And then, so equity is our biggest asset class, but of course we also get fixed income, which is another major asset class. So under the fixed income space, we can get investment grade fixed income, we can call that category three, and then we get non-investment grade fixed income, we can call that category four, for example. So all the... Uh, equity growth company, all, all the equity, all the funds that are equity growth funds going to category one, and all the funds that are equity value funds going to category two, and all the funds that are uh, investment grade fixed income going to category three, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we get many, many more classifications than just this. We'll also get, you know, real estate funds and many other types, which we'll, which we'll be talking about as we go through the curriculum. So, then um, we can, another good example of nominal data is sectors that we get on the stock exchanges. Like we know we know get many, we get many sectors on the stock exchange, like for the financial sector, the IT sector, energy, real estate, of course, there's many more, like re the retail sector, the resources sector. So these sectors, they can also be given numerical codes. So for example, on a stock exchange, all the financial stocks might be under a uh, numerical code 100. And the IT stocks may be numerical code, all go under numerical code 200. So um, what's important here is that it does not mean that the IT stocks, because their code is 200, have got a higher ranking than the financials, just because the financials code is 100. Right. So now let's look at the ordinal data. So these are values that can be logically ordered or ranked. So the best thing to do is just to look at some examples to see how this ordinal data works. So for example, the first one we're going to look at is the credit ratings for corporate bond issues. So we mentioned just now that one means that companies can use to raise money is to issue bonds. And now there are rating agencies that rate the strength of these bonds. So they'll rate the ability of the companies to pay back the money. So the, the, the most common rating agencies, I'm sure you've heard of them that we get out there are Standard & Poor's, Moody's and Fitch. So they'll have ratings on the bonds. So the, the best rating they can give is a triple A rating. And that, that's, that's very, very, very strong. So in there, we can be almost certain that the company will, will pay back the money. So then we go from triple A to double A to A. So as we go down, you know, the, the ability to, for the, of the company to pay back the money, it, it, it worsens. So then we get uh, triple B and double B and B, et cetera. So what's important here is that we can say, of course, that a triple A rating is, is better than triple B, but we can't say by how much. And we're going to be emphasizing that again in a couple of minutes time. Right. And then another good example is the morning star. They give star ratings for investment funds. So if, if the fund gets one star, then they're the, then they, 
part of the worst performance um, category. But if you get two stars, then you get better. So as you get more and more stars, you are better. But again, we can't say by how much. And then what we can also do with ordinal data is that numbers, they can be used just to identify categories. So for example, if there are 100 stocks in the tech sector, then the number one, that can be given to the best performing 20 stocks. And we can give the number two, we give the number two to the next best 20 stocks. So therefore we're gonna have five numbers altogether. So what we can say is this, we can say that stocks in group one, they've performed better than group two, but this is the important part. We can't say by how much. And the same then with the, the credit ratings for the bond issues, and the same with the, the Morningstar star ratings. We can't say how much better uh, one is than the other. We just said it, it is better, but we can't say by how much. And then in these examples, um, in other words, what, what we can say is that we can't establish, we can't establish the numerical difference between each category because these are not numerical data. So we can then also say this, that meaningful arithmetic calculations, they can be done on numerical data, which is over here. They can be done on this numerical data, like basic calculations but we can't do calculations on our categorical or our qualitative data. Okay, right. So the next uh, comparison we're gonna do is cross-sectional versus time series versus panel data. So we're gonna first start off with a couple of definitions before we look at these different types of data. So a variable, has got a lot of names as a variable is also called a field an attribute or a feature. So this is a characteristic or quantity that is subject to change. So that's why it's called a variable and it can be measured, counted or categorized. So for example, a share price, you know, share prices, we know they change all the time and dividends that change depending on the company's profits and the earnings per share depend, change all the time, of course, depending on what the profits are. And then the price to earnings ratio, we're gonna talk, be talking a lot about this when we get to the, um, the equity section. But just for now, if we do a little, little example, all the price to earnings ratio is, is the share price divided by the earnings per share. So let's say, for example, a company's got a share price of $10 and the earnings per share is $1. That means that the price to earnings ratio is 10. So what this means is that the share price, it's 10 times higher than the earnings per share. So what are we doing? We are paying a multiple of 10 times for that company's earnings. So don't worry too much about this. For now, it's just a little introduction to the B ratio. We're gonna talk a lot, of, a lot about this when we, when we get to equity, but we can see that it is a variable because as the price or the earnings change, then this, this rate, little ratio will also change. And what about an observation? Well, this is the value of a specific variable collected at a point in time or over a specified time period. So for example, we've got here yeah, the dividend per share of Southern Industrial in, in 2021, it was $2.50 per share. So it's giving us the value at that specific period in time. And now if we come to our different types of data here. So what is cross-sectional data? This is now a list of the observations of a specific variable from multiple observational units at a given point in time. So for example, if we take the returns in 2020 for all technology stocks, what's great about this is that we can now compare. So let's let's take let's take let's say the, the, the tech stocks in America, let's think of the big ones. Like we can look at, we can compare now the returns of Facebook. To, to Apple and Amazon and Google and Microsoft and all of them. And now that's cross-sectional because now, we, now we're comparing the returns of those shares over that specific year. So that is cross-sectional data. Now, what about time series data? This is now a sequence of observations only now for a single observational unit. And, and cross-sectional was for many companies. So now we're looking at the the, the 
the sequence of observations of for, of a, for a single observational unit of a specific variable that's collected over time and at discrete and at usually equally spaced intervals of time. So we could do, for example, something on a monthly basis like the example here. So let's look at the closing price of Apple, uh, of Apple shares at the end of each month for 2020. So now we're only looking at, you know, what is the share price of Apple at the end of each month. So we, it's, this is our time series data. So it's only for a single unit in, in this case, which is Apple, right? And now what is panel data? Hi, so panel data is now a combination or a mix of the two above. It's, it's a mix of the time series and the cross-sectional data that consists of observations through time on one or more variables for multiple observational units. So that sounds like a bit of a mouthful, but if we do this little example here, basically what's at the bottom of the slide, I've copied and pasted into here. So we into a little example so we can see how it works. So what we've got is the earnings per share. So, so, so all the earnings per share is, is the company's earnings divided by the number of shares and it gives us the earnings per share. So now we've got the earnings per share of three companies in a year. So we've got uh, for the, the, the time period, we're looking at the first quarter, the second quarter, the third quarter, the fourth quarter, and we are comparing these three companies over here. So we can see that each row is, like we said on the previous data, that is now on the previous slide, that is now cross-sectional data. It shows the earnings per share of all three companies. So cross-sectional, we're now comparing. We're comparing the EPS of all three companies for a particular quarter. So we can see, we can compare Harris Corp's e EPS in quarter one there to Midlands Corp EPS in quarter one there to, e to Easy Corp's EPS over there in, in quarter one. And now, as far as the columns go, well, now each column is a time series of data because it's showing the quarterly EPS observations from the first quarter to the fourth quarter for each and every company. So for example, let's look at Harris. So now we can see how, how Harris on its own in this column is doing from quarter one to quarter two. Are they growing there? From quarter two to quarter three, are they took a bit of a dip in the EPS, something must have happened there, the, the, the profits went down a bit. And then from quarter three to quarter four, we can see there that they grew again. Great. So now we next and next one next one we need to look at is the structured versus the unstructured data. So first of all, structured. This is now highly organized data in a predefined way, and it's normally with repeating patterns. So these are the forms we have. We can get one-dimensional arrays. So for example, the time series of a single variable. So for example, we looked at that Apple example just now, you know, what was the closing share price of Apple each month for the year? I think we were using 2020. So that'll, that's an example of one dimensional array. And then now two dimensional data tables. So that, that is what we looked at then on our previous slide. So here are some examples for us of structured uh, financial data. So with market data, this is now data issued by stock exchanges. So, if, so the stock exchanges, for example, they give us the daily the, the, daily, the daily closing price, stock prices, and also not only that, the volume. So we can also see, you know, how many shares of each company was traded on a certain day. And then with fundamental data, this is data that we get in the financial statements. So. For example, we've got the EP, the earnings per share we've spoken about, we've spoken about the P ratios, uh, the dividend yield. Well, all that is, a yield is always something divided by price. So if it's dividend yield, it's going to be the dividend divided by the share price. And then the analytical data, this is now the rate that's, of course, derived from analytics. So we're doing forecasts, so things like uh, cash flow projections or forecasted earnings growth, those kind of things. So now let's have a look at the unstructured data. So here, this now, it does not follow any conventionally organized form. So for example, text, 
like uh, financial news and social media posts. And that is unstructured. It's not following any type of organized form. And then also audio or video type of data because like things like uh, presentations to end this, that's not following any organized form. So that is also gonna be unstructured data. So the unstructured data, they are typically alternative data and they usually collected from unconventional sources. And they can be classified into three groups according to the source from which the data are generated. So we look, let's have a look at these three over here. So first of all, they can be produced by us, by individuals. So things like social media posts. So for example, if somebody posts on social media, I'm just loving my new Netflix package. Well, that information is now gonna be used as part of the analysis for Netflix. So that's gonna be a positive attribute for Netflix. So and not only now are we looking at numbers, you know, what, what is Netflix revenue and earnings per share and profits and all that. We're now also taking this into account when we are analyzing Netflix. And we're going to be talking more about this when we get to the FinTech reading. And then uh, the, the, next, the next source is um, data that's generated by business processes. So for example, all our credit card transactions and the point of sale scanner data that we see at the shops. And then the, the last one is data generated by sensors. So if we think about all the satellite imagery out there, and of course, if we think about um, the chips in our smartphones, wow, how much, how much data that's generating, well, that, that's a tremendous amount as we know Right. And now the financial models, they can usually only use structured data as inputs. So what does this mean? This means that the unstructured data first has to be transformed into structured data. And that's what we're going to talk about right now on the next slide. We're going to now be looking at organizing data for quantitative analysis. And I just want to quickly read this LOS to you. I've just got it in front of me here. I've got my book ready. It says, um, describe how data are organized for quantitative analysis. So let's have a look at it. So as we've been saying from the start is that we usually can't use raw data directly in our analysis. Oh, oops, oops, I've got a bit of a repetition there. I'll, I'll fix it on your slide, sorry about that. We, so we normally can't use raw data directly in our analysis and modeling. So what does it what does mean? It requires that the, the input data, it's got to be cleaned and formatted. So the raw data that we have can be organized into what we call a one-dimensional array or a two-dimensional rectangular array. So the one-dimensional array, that's nice and easy. It just represents a collection of data of the same data type, and it's suitable for representing a single variable because it is one dimensional array. So for example, the, the example we've seen before, the, 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 the closing prices of, of a stock, let's say over a month. So we take, let's say, for example, the daily close, the, the, the daily closing price for, for, for a share over a one month period. Now, a two dimensional rectangular array, or what we also call a data table, here, columns, they hold multiple variables. And the rows, they hold multiple observations. So we're going to well, what I've put over there, I've basically copied and pasted this and added some information for us to understand this into this example over here. So here's our example. So we've got the metrics used in an analyst evaluation of Khajiso Enterprises. They are looking at, the analyst is looking at revenue, earnings per share and dividends when analyzing Cajiso Enterprise. And of course, the analysts will use many other metrics as well. So things like the, the cash flow, uh, the debt, the, the equity of the company, the assets, all that. But we're just making it nice and simple here. So this, this is the, the info that the analyst has retrieved. So we can see uh, for the, the fiscal half, we've got June, over here, June, we can see what the revenue and the earnings per share and the dividends per share was for year one and year two. And then for the second half of the year, 
what were what were the numbers over there? So this is the this is the info now in a raw format. So we, but if we put it now into a nice data table, it's sorted in a much nicer way. So as we said on the previous slide, what do the columns do? They hold multiple variables, um, and our variables we're looking at here are revenue earnings per share and dividends per share. So the, rev the variables are also called the features or the attributes. So we can see how the revenue, for example, is changing, you know, as we, as we move down in time. And now what about the rows? Well, the rows, they hold observations for different variables in a time ordered sequence. So we can see with the rows here, you know, how is the revenue changing from 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 the first half of of the year of year one to the second half and then how is it changing there in the first half of of, of year two to the second half of year two for example so that the, those roles those rows then they provide us that nice ordered info that we are looking for great so that's the end then of that class and we'll see you guys in the next class Hello, it's Tim here again. I hope you enjoyed the class and found it beneficial. We have some classes available for free on YouTube, but we have classes for the entire curriculum. The classes that are not on YouTube can be purchased from us. If you'd like to purchase the classes, please contact us for the pricing, and I've put our contact details over here. You can purchase all the classes or certain readings that you would like. When you purchase the classes, we provide you with the slides and our notes. I've assisted hundreds of candidates pass CFA exams, and I look forward to also helping you through the CFA program. I've put in two testimonials in the slide over here, and we also have a testimonials page at, on our website that you can review. I look forward to seeing you soon and all the best.